Um, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, join you for this breakfast club uh, in downtown Toronto. Uh, I am impressed and slightly amazed that uh, so many of you have been able to uh, uh, deal with the vagaries of Toronto traffic or uh, of the elevator system uh, in order to get here in time, but I really appreciate the invitation and very much appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, exchange some thoughts and views about uh, what I think is becoming one of the central core critical issues of our time, which is the incredible large changeover in the way in which uh, people are moving around this world, oftentimes driven to move around this world, and about the need to begin to provide some uh, rethink, reset of a lot of the standard conventions uh, simply to begin to cope. And I was uh, looking at your program and I just realized that uh, in talking about partnership, uh, one of the uh, critical partnerships that has to take place and I think has generally taken place in this country over the last 20 or 30 years has been uh, important partnerships between those working in the field on the front lines uh, with the uh, public policy makers and, and others to try to get it right. And I'm not saying we have it absolutely right, but I think that this has been one of the distinctive hallmarks of, of our own kind of Canadian approach, uh, going back into the mid-70s when the Immigration Act was changed under Bud Cullen, uh, and then particularly when the incredible sort of surge of uh, people coming from the uh, aftermath of the wars in Vietnam and Indochina began to really uh, pile up around the world and that there was really a, uh, not an international system. The old the NHCR system was geared to dealing with much more small individual kind of responses that really required a real reset and uh, uh, a way of adapting to a big shift in the way that things were happening. And I want to share this with you. Uh, in the uh, period of transition between uh, Joe Clark's government, uh, where the first uh, major wave of uh, refugees were coming out of Indochina, and there was some attempts to try to uh, understand how we would cope with it in, ca in the country itself, uh, Ron Atke, who was then the uh, minister in the Clark government for uh, employment and immigration, uh, asked if I would join him for a cup of coffee. Uh, in those days, we were even partnerships between people of different parties and different governments. And I'll never forget uh, this exchange because it sort of really set my gyroscope or my compass uh, for many years after. He said, you know, uh, becoming a Minister of Immigration, that you have an awful lot to say and do about defining what Canada is and what it will be. And he said that so many of us uh, get wound up in our smaller kind of areas of competence and interest, but the whole decision about who comes to Canada and how they are treated and the kind of rules and protections and opportunities we offer really is to, going to define who we are. Uh, and I should say, by the way, just to pay compliments to, to Ron Atke, he just died last year, uh, really at too young an age, but he really was a thoughtful man. And, and I felt the same as I became part of the Immig Department of Immigration and began to understand much better the kind of day-by-day -day, uh, trials. But it, one of the first things uh, that we had to decide to do was how to uh, really engage much more closely, to become much more in part of a, a, of a partnership. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there's a little friction between governments and NGOs and private sector. They're not, never too sure about the agendas being put forward. But in this case, I think particularly because they, we were trying to make operational uh, that uh, section of the act, which allowed for private sponsorships, uh, that we had to provide a vehicle and a, uh, 
set of uh, opportunities, like this actually, to help say how do we define it? How do we, uh, what are the guidelines? What kind of engagement can we expect from Canadians? We didn't know. I mean, we had never done it before. We, meaning the government of Canada or the people of Canada, that we would actually be able to uh, find enough people in the country uh, to sponsor refugees coming up. Well, as you all know, uh, the response was overwhelming. Uh, it was impossible to find enough refugees, in a way, uh, to meet the kind of demand from Canadians. And since then, it's become such a kind of a trademark, if you like, of our, of our uh, overall scheme, not exclusively so, because it doesn't stand by itself. It also stands by the fact that one of the other major changes that we initiated, um, as, when I say we, because uh, Ron Atke and, his, and the, uh, Mr. Clark's government had started it, and then we had to pick up in the early 1980 when the election was held, the follow-through uh, was how do you begin to uh, uh, provide a framework so that people know exactly what it is you can do and, and to keep it open enough to allow for creativity and individual sort of responses. Uh, you know, I, I go back, I hate to admit it, but 28 years as a, an elected member, both provincially and federally, I think that was one of the uh, most Im important uh, initiatives I've been involved in, uh, because it, Ron Ackley was right, that that partnership that had to be developed to be all of a sudden implement a massive change, 60,000 uh, refugees came through on that designated program. Uh, and uh, I think, Vicki, you would have a better idea because you study it, but from all the tracking I've seen, that the integration of the, those 60,000 refugees from Southeast Asia has been a remarkable contribution to the overall country itself. You don't even think about it anymore because it's become such an integrated part of who we are. And it's just broadened itself out. And I think that was again demonstrated that uh, in the latest surge uh, of refugees that all of a sudden hit Europe in 2015, and uh, to be blunt and uh, honest, I was in Europe at the time. I had been asked to, by the Bosch Foundation in Germany uh, to spend time kind of talking about the Canadian model, uh, giving some assistance or helping to set out uh, the options and choices that, that were there. And it, I found that uh, there wasn't that same public policy setting. I mean, I don't want to go too hard on that, but the reality is that there, there wasn't much of a framework. That, that you had guest workers, you had sort of foreign workers, you had people who were temporarily in the country itself, but never given that opportunity to say, this is a clear pathway, to use your expressions of the conference, a clear pathway to becoming a citizen, if you want. And nobody's telling you, you if you arrive in Canada and that you uh, get landed, that you have to, but the reality is the choice is there. And it was that whole question of choice, of uh, giving some real voice to the concerns of those who were coming and some involvement that I thought, again, is part of the uh, trademark or signature that we're trying to provide eventually. And as you realize now, that we're only one of maybe two or three countries in the world today in which uh, we have a clear public statement that we're, we're open, uh, that we're plural, that we're diversified, and that we're multicultural. Now, do we always live up to those standards? No, but we're the only ones who set up as the values and standards that we believe in uh, through the expressions of our public policy and the ones that try to live it through by the kind of work that many of you do, both in your uh, frontline work operationally and, uh, and also in the kind of research and scholarly efforts. In fact, uh, well, I have to tell you that I'm kind of a product of one of those uh, partnerships because uh, I see Jan Stewart here from the University of Winnipeg and one of the, my first uh, acts of becoming president was that she had established a refugee camp on the front lawn of the university and then I was expected to kind of show up and uh, uh, act out my role as a refugee, and uh, it was an incredible experience. 
Uh, the only thing I was concerned about is that I really didn't like sleeping on wet grass. It, uh, you reach a certain age where your body tells you this is not exactly what you should be spending your time doing. And I pay the price for it now. But uh, that's where we're at. And, and so those choices have been made. We're not working sort of in an ad hoc way. There's a, a framework that's been there. There's been patterns established. And I think your own uh, pathways group of partnership is a, a, a further example of the evolution of how to bring together those kind of relationships and, and cooperation. And what was also uh, very revealing uh, when I was in uh, Germany last year, and I've just come back from six weeks in both uh, Middle Europe, Germany and Austria, but also spent close to two weeks in the Balkans. Now there's a different world, I can tell you. Uh, and you just realize uh, how far the spectrum sort of stretches out these days when it comes to immigration. We are losing uh, in this uh, world of ours, this changing world, uh, the whole commitment, the whole uh, value commitment uh, to the right of people to get sanctuary and to be treated with respect. Um, I think uh, uh, Dean Doverne at the University of British Columbia has written in her latest book about the increasing criminalization of refugees being seen as potential terrorists or rapists, to use the famous expression from the United States president. Uh, and that the whole idea is to provide enforcement, which is necessary, but uh, in the European context, that has really become, uh, if not the commitment uh, in the mainstream, the mainstream is scared like hell of the emergence of the new right-wing nationalist uh, sort of white power supremacists that are taking place in virtually every country. Uh, it, is, it was disturbing for, I guess, some of us uh, old veterans who used to say that the European Union was the uh, model for integration, for cooperation, for bringing countries together to work jointly on common issues. And that's not happening today. It's, it's broken down. The, the political consensus is broken down. Uh, the will to do it has uh, really been fragmented, and that there is uh, sort of a lot of energy. You know, what's the old saying from poem? The best lack all conviction, and the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I think we're beginning to see that really very much uh, in the context of what happened in Europe. And I think part of the problem was is that uh, they had never ex accepted the idea that uh, being a place of sanctuary, of asylum, of offering protection for those who have been forced, in so many cases, from their natural home and, uh, and uh, homelands, that uh, there wasn't a good public policy in place. It was sort of bits and pieces. And it was very much designed in and around the internal movements in Europe itself. That was one of the real problems, that much of the antipathy uh, towards immigration and refugees was because of the uh, European Union's uh, own policy uh, encouraging internal movement. Uh, and much of it had come from Eastern Europe into Germany and Britain and France and other places. And I think what bothered people the most, and I, you know, I'd be interested in your reflections, uh, was the sense that it wasn't being managed. And I don't want to use that word in some kind of you know, uh, administrative way, but that there was a feeling that someone in government somewhere uh, knew what they were doing and actually had a plan and a framework and a blueprint about how to proceed with it uh, and that uh, the thing that I found in Germany over the past year is uh, that here's this powerful, rich, uh, incredibly uh, talented country wrestling with the question of how to do it. Because it had never been part of their public debate. They, the, the political system had never taken into account uh, what it is that they wanted to do. And what was the, the there was a, some underlying assumptions about what it was to be Germans, but uh, as Chancellor Merkel said, uh, 
when she was under criticism for her, her move to accept refugees, she said, look, uh, Germany brought East and West together. We've been part of the integration program for a long time. So what's the deal? Uh, and it, it was hard for so many to accept because the experience uh, that they had was not one uh, of saying that this is part of our commitment. Uh, you can make a good, as you know, economic arguments that virtually all the countries of Europe, including, and we can incorporate ourselves into that, is uh, hitting a kind of a demographic uh, uh, a precipice. And I want to come back to that because there's people in this country who have some interesting answers to it. But uh, there was no sort of pathway. And again, to use, the, if I might borrow the word of your conference, the pathway means a choice. But, you know, pathways are, are not necessarily straight, linear roads. They have junctions, they have intersections that you can, if you listen to Robert Frost, take the wrong one sometimes. Uh, but it, it has to be grounded in some agreement politically uh, that the, here is a public policy framework that actually suits where the population is. And if, and I say this, I guess, someone who was in public life for close to 30 years, uh, it's not just to be reactive. It's to go out and lead, to say, there are things we have to do that sometimes you may not like, but we're going to have to do them. And there were many times we would get a Supreme Court decision arising from a charter case, and I would go back to my constituency in Winnipeg South Center, uh, do a quick poll and realize that 80% uh, of the pop of my constituents were opposed to it, and I had to vote for it. But part of that process was being able to work in the community with the groups who were connected to it, whether it was on uh, women's rights or gender rights or on abortion rights, uh, to the point where actually, over time, people began to accept this. And one of the, I think, uh, Vic, I don't know if you've seen numbers, but I've you know, been reading about how the millennials and even the junior millennials coming up to our schools and universities don't consider these wedge issues to be wedge issues. That's over, done. I, we, we don't have to debate it anymore. And that is very sort of comparatively different from what you see happening south of us, see what you hap see happening in other countries. The, the combination of the charter establishing the rights of groups to extend themselves, I think has been an enormous sort of a buttress to the whole immigration refugee program because it establishes those as rights. And I don't mean in the way that they are kind of nagging rights. They're just there. They, are, uh, they come with a package. And when you arrive here and get on the shore and are accepted, you get the rights. And there's no argument about it because we've already been through that debate in the 1980s and uh, we came out on, the, I think, the right end of the stick. So, I, I want to pose to you uh, a couple of those pathways, options that uh, need to be looked at. Uh, as we all know, just uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, the uh, Minister of Immigration did the annual sort of um, plan, uh, and this time it was a multi-year plan to increase uh, immigration up to 340,000 which in some cases is almost double what it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, and it was heralded, I think properly so, as a progressive but incremental step. Incremental is the key word here, meaning we can't go so far out that we're gonna get too many um, kickbacks, pushbacks, blowbacks, because uh, that's part of the uh, role of being uh, in public life. You have to learn how to count. And if your count isn't exactly what it should be, you will not be in public life that much longer. And I think that there is an, uh, an assessment going on that clearly we need more people. We know what the demographic uh, drop is going to be in the next five years in terms of skilled workers and people to do it. And I know there's all kinds of debates going on about the... Uh, uh, implications of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, climate change and if the legislation that's now going through the Congress of the United States happens, there's going to be even more pressure because there's going to be demands that we reduce our 
levels of services and provide a new tax framework that's going to be very difficult to cope with because they were so close. But at the same time, I think that we are, you know, are understanding that we just need to have, I think the estimate of the conference board is about another five million uh, workers just to kind of keep our existing systems in place. That's a lot of people, but not necessarily. I think we're beginning to make some headway, and I'd be interested, you know, in, in your discussions yesterday about the involvement of uh, Aboriginal Métis uh, Inuit people, because I think that is now being recognized as a, a, an area that's been neglected far too long from a public policy point of view, and slowly steps are being taken. I know that at our own university, uh, I think when I arrived there, Jen, in 2004, I think our participation rate was about 7% of Aboriginals, now it's close to 15%. So it's just been a major change, but it didn't happen for nothing. I mean, it happened because I think as a university, uh, through the board and the uh, faculty and, uh, and the students, we simply said, we gotta change our ways. We have to take barriers down and actually provide incentives forward. And that's just simply made a difference. We, and, and it's no longer a debate anymore. It's just how to make it work. And I think that's happening right across the country. Not nearly fast enough. It, a lot of things are still up in the air. But I can see that that is beginning to be part of our new kind of package of uh, partnership. And that's why I think your discussions here about how to integrate the two are really important. Because I can tell you from a perspective of, uh, of being in Winnipeg and uh, having been involved in inner city issues for over 30 years, uh, that there is, a, that there is a divide. You know, there are walls uh, growing up um, between not just Aboriginal and newcomers and refugees and immigrants, also between uh, the suburbs and the inner city. Uh, so a city that for a long time made itself work because of its integration is finding it more and more difficult to keep those conversations going. So what do we do about this? Uh, is the... Um, present framework that was announced two weeks ago, uh, the right pathway. I mean, have, have you and your individual work or academic practices taken a look and said, yeah, that just about fits where we're at, uh, who we are, and what kind of uh, issues we're going to be dealing with uh, in the broader global framework, because we can no longer you know, uh, have the same uh, way of uh, being protected uh, by being on the North American continent that we had before. We're now very much part of this new global system. And it's not the same. It has huge impacts on who we are, uh, where we trade, what do we make, what do we educate, where, where are people coming from. And just, uh, take a look at the, uh, the efforts now. As we look at the headlines about NAFTA discussions, we realize that uh, this is a framework that was done, well, I was still around Parliament then. Uh, I'm not sure it fits anymore. Because I think for, uh, from the point of view of Canada, we have to diversify our economic contacts. We can't, because the United States is by its own decision making, by its own political system, is withdrawing from a global player. It still is powerful, it's got lots of the biggest military in the world, but in terms of its engagement in a whole set of uh, cooperative, collaborative, international things, they're not there anymore. They've disappeared. I, I mean, I really, literally mean it. At the last meeting, I mean, if you can believe it, I, I know this is a digression, and I apologize, but of the, uh, signatories to the Paris Agreement, the United States showed up uh, and talked about the importance of coal as an answer to climate change. As uh, some American columnists said, it's like uh, uh, somebody uh, supporting the tobacco industry showing up at a you know, cancer prevention conference. Uh, it's the, has the same kind of impact. They're simply not increasingly irrelevant to what's going on. So where does that fit? We have, we have gauged ourselves so closely in step uh, with our North American uh, neighbor and partner. So now we have to kind of get out there on our own a little bit. 
and begin to discover different pathways uh, around this. And I think different pathways inside the country itself in terms of uh, what kind of business do we do, what kind of skills do we want to have, well, and what's our attitude. And in that sense, I think we have made really, so far, good choices. I mean, we're not buying in to the close your door, you know, shut the windows, uh, and blame uh, the immigrant for their problems. That's because that's become such a standard uh, agenda in so much of a, the political world. But here's, here's the option. That, a year ago, uh, the chair, actually the full advisory group to the Minister of Finance, the economic advisory group, uh, composed of, I think, a range of people from business and the academic world, came out with a proposal, as many of you know, called uh, the uh, uh, Century Initiative. And what they're talking about is that they believe that for Canada to work, we need to have a million, a hundred million people in our population base by the end of the century. I, I said a hundred million, not one, a hundred million. Uh, that's sort of twice, three times the number that we have right now as Canadians. And that means that it's going to come about primarily uh, through immigration, refugees, uh, people coming from other countries. Now, you know, I, I'm not giving you the, the quick fix panacea solution, but I'm telling you, because you're in the field. Are we ready for it? Uh, is it something we should debate? Is it something, and, and what's, what's the reasoning for it? There's a, by the way, an in, interesting book just out by Doug Saunders, who's the uh, international affairs columnist for the Globe and Mail, just come out with a book called uh, Maximum Canada. And he's making the same case, that right now we don't have enough people in this country to pay the taxes, to provide the talent, uh, to support a critical mass of investment in our schools and in our health system, uh, to really be a player. And that, as a result, we're always going to be kind of straggling along, trying to uh, balance our economics and our demographics and our political interests. But he said there were simply not enough people in the country to do that anymore. There's too many to multiple uh, new areas of competence, of interest, of involvement, that it's going to require new creative in interest, it's going to require a lot of new people to do it. And so one of the real kind of partnership questions that I can put, I think that uh, groups like yourself and maybe this organization has to take on is uh, this issue of what is our, what is our maximum? What, what are we aiming at? Uh, not next year or even the year, uh, two years or three years from now. Overall, from a point of view of our future generations, our kids, grandchildren, everything else, uh, what's the choice? That's, that's got to be part of the debate. That's got to be part of the dialogue that uh, the uh, nonprofit sector, the business sector, the academic sector has to have with the public sector, with government, to determine whether, in fact, uh, there's got to be some changes. And if so, are we prepared to put the resources, the infrastructure, the, the talent, and the opportunities to be able to integrate and involve and engage people? Uh, and I think part of the... Uh, Missing part of that governance right now, if I might be allowed, is that there isn't much of a voice for refugees in that dialogue. There's groups representing them, but you know, from a point of view of a governance system, um, I think we've got to really look at how democratic we are being in terms of making these fundamental decisions uh, and who's involved in making them. That's, and I, I, I would hope in your conversations uh, today, you might, or over coffee, uh, discuss that kind uh, of issue. So there is a real pathway, and it may be a pathway that really is veering, uh, very you know, almost by uh, 90 degrees off the ones that we're used to. But it's a legitimate one, and now there's a, what is called the second century uh, uh, task, uh, pardon me, uh, think tank, which is now beginning to generate the facts and figures and the research and the assessments about what does it mean? Because I would suspect that uh, we, can't, we can't dally around too long uh, or dither too long. These are choices that need to be made now. Uh, and I think that the, that is one of the areas where I think uh, your organization uh, 
particularly as it brings together so many of those involved from so many sectors in this field uh, are going to have, uh, I hope, uh, an important role to play in helping to define that. And it shouldn't just be the economic think tanks, the CD House, and the others that do it. I think it's got to be one that's also based on practical. And what do you think, your business, the, how Canadians will react? Uh, I mean, it means going from, uh, let's say this year, 315,000 uh, newcomers to close to half a million in the beginning in the next couple of years. So uh, that's a very big new sort of uh, large cohort of people to begin absorbing in terms of our uh, workplace, in terms of our educational systems, our health system, and so on. And yet what the argument about it is if we don't do it, uh, we're going to get tripped up very soon because we simply won't have enough people making enough money to support those systems that we now have. So that's, that's another pathway that I'd like to put out there for you to think about. I'm not endorsing and I'm just saying, uh, boy, from a public policy point of view, uh, again, we're in this kind of the Ron Atke uh, you know, uh, advice. Uh, you're going to define what Canada's going to be. And it's got to be done in a way that we're fairly sure that, uh, that the options are ones that will work and will be accepted, that there will be, that you won't so begin to uh, augment the kind of uh, nastiness that is hiding away in various corners around the country about accepting new people, the kind of anti-immigration feelings that we're seeing in other places. But then let me give you uh, another crossroads in that pathway, uh, and one that probably maybe merges with the one I've just talked about, or maybe not, and that is what's happening internationally in terms of the uh, incredible uh, and, again, uh, surprising and difficult reality that we are now dealing with probably about 200 million uh, people who are displaced on the move, being forced out for reasons of conflict, war, disaster, environment, uh, or just the simple yearning to move. Of those, uh, officially, there's about 22 million refugees. And uh, while you know, we got, as Canadians, pretty excited when some of those began crossing the borders this past year because of the restrictions in the United States, uh, how would you like to be in Uganda right now, where over a million South Sudanese are now filling in the country's uh, refugee camps and refugee systems? They have had to accept close to three or four hundred thousand. Or let's try uh, the Rohingyas coming out of Myanmar. Six hundred thousand going into the, one of the poorest countries in the world. Six hundred thousand people that have to be settled. And uh, there is no provision for it. Uh, there was really no real planning for it. And so we're kind of, again, uh, making it up as we go along. Because part of the breakdown of our international refugee system, it's based entirely, entirely on voluntary choices by individual governments. There is no requirement. There's no enforcement. There is no common practice. The United Nations uh, will have an assessed uh, donation from every country that they're required to pay. But when it comes to refugees, it's all voluntary. It's like you know, holding an auction or organizing a gala for your daughter's gala, you know, a prom. Uh, everything is dependent upon voluntary donations. Uh, and the scope and range of that just far surpasses the system. It just doesn't exist. The, there was an effort uh, made, uh, I was in Jordan just as part of my work at the uh, Refugee Council, uh, they have close to a million refugees, some in camps, most of them in, in the cities and small towns in Jordan. They need, uh, oh, probably a minimum, 250 million, half a billion dollars a year just to pay the basic maintenance. They had a pledging conference in London, and 13% of the requirement was met. 
So what are they doing? They're cutting back rations, they're cutting back services, they're cutting back the effort to just keep people with enough food and water. Uh, and that is, uh, then there's going to be another pledging conference for what's happening you know, coming in Burundi in Tanzania, uh, major sort of pledging conferences emerging uh, so that there isn't simply enough, quote, volunteer goodwill, especially because of the political climate we're in, to support that system. So that uh, was one of the reasons when the, the, the last year the United Nations decided to hold a, a series of negotiations around a new global compact on migration and on refugees. But the problem is it's kind of an in-house thing. And I don't want to be overly critical, but I've been in enough UN meetings to know that those in-house UN meetings are not exactly the seedbed for a lot of creative thinking. Tweaking, yes. Uh, adjustment, of course. Uh, but uh, real change, no. So that's why the uh, refugee, World Refugee Council was established, uh, to bring, as someone said, a frontal cortex uh, into the issue, to bring a kind of front brain to say, that there's things we have to do differently, that we have to really uh, look at the system uh, more effectively. Because you know, there's a lot of myth. Uh, we talk about accepting 45, 50,000 Syrian refugees, okay? Very nice commitment to make. But compared to the demands out there, Turkey has four million refugees. Lebanon, close to a million. Jordan, close to a million. Uh, and there are more coming. This estimate this year is another three or four hundred thousand. And how did they get there? On rickety boats in the Mediterranean, subject to the worst practices of uh, the international criminal class who are kind of using this as a way, another way of padding their pockets. And so, you know, what, what I thought was, uh, in a way, uh, uh, a, a real discrepancy, a, a real dysfunction. Again, being in Europe, uh, the media was talking about the need, how do we sit, get our destroyers to stop this movement of people coming out of Libya into Greece and Turkey? And saying, wait a minute, uh, I don't think that's the issue. I mean, people are not coming necessarily because they think this is vacation time and they want to sit on the island of Lapidusa, you know, in a refugee camp. Because what they realize now is that to become a refugee is not a temporary short-term existence. The average sort of retention time now is 9, 10, 12, 15 years. You've now got... Uh, large settlements around the world, the, the Daba camp in Kenya, the El Zatiri camp in Jordan, where you've got 80,000, 100,000 people. We actually, if you combine you know, the refugee cohort with the in, internally displaced persons that are in Iraq and Syria alone, you would have a population the size of the United Kingdom. Uh, all, do, all needing services, all needing places to do, and, you know, and some of the figures. Uh, you know, David Miliband from the Rescue Committee has just come out with a, a, a short book, but I think he, he, you know, he gets it right. He said, uh, of those, uh, only 600,000 kids have any access to education. There are hundreds of thousands of young people in these camps who simply are not able to, to go to school, period. And there's efforts, some of our universities, some other to do online training and to set up. But in, compared to the need, you create a large sort of clustering of people who are young, energetic, and with no education. That's a recipe for trouble. So this is not something that is a, a matter of uh, noblesse oblige. This is a matter of our own stability and our own security and our own commitments. I mean, I think there's a, a moral authority that comes to this, but at the same time, uh, we are so connected these days, and we all know we don't have to, I don't have to spell out because it's full of, in the media every day about you know, terrorist attacks, uh, unpleasant demonstrations taking place.
Uh, and that is partly because the system is not functioning. And I'm not here to be critical, I'm just saying, you know, we come to grips with it. Paradigms change, right? There was a time we all thought that the sun moved around the earth until Galileo came along and said, no, it's the other way around. But remember, it took the Catholic Church until 1910 to accept that finding. They weren't quite prepared to see that paradigm shift. Well, that's where we are today. You've got all kinds of governments out there, supported by political parties, supported by rich donors, who are saying, no, no, uh, let's go back to where we were. Let's go back to those halcyon days, whenever they were, uh, of white man rule. Well, I guess there was a time, and probably still is, where that's the case, but it's changing. And I think that the whole issue that we're now dealing with, with this movement, and so let's layer that on top of the previous, I'm sorry, that kind of woke you up, right? <laughs> um, you layer that on top of the other commitment about how many people do we need? How many people are we going to invite? How are we going to do the settlement and integration? We're probably then talking about, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe another doubling our refugee rate from the present plan, which is 45,000, and say maybe, why don't we head for 100,000? So that by the next 10 or 20 years, we actually provide that resettlement option. It's, it, it is foolish to think that the refugee issue is going to be solved by reorganizing uh, our development programs so we can dig more irrigation ditches so that people can be protected against the vicious changes going on in their climate. Simply not the case. We have 10 civil conflicts going in around the world. 10. There's more fighting going on than there was 20 years ago. And it's a nasty word because it's civil wars. It's not armies marching with flags flying and drums banging. They are deep, ethnic-based, sectoral kinds of issues. And you go into the country, and what are we doing? Well, in Syria, we just washed our hands of it because we had made a mistake in Libya. And I was very much involved as a foreign minister in coming to grips with what's the international responsibility for the protection of people. Never mind protection of nation states, the protection of people. And we established the whole concept of responsibility to protect that became part of our foreign policy until the change in government. And why? <clears throat> because uh, that was more important in, our, in my view uh, and in the people in foreign affairs at the time uh, than protecting, quote, sovereignty and nation state stuff. There's just too many people who were being vulnerable, who were, and they were mainly uh, women and children. And if you look at the conflict numbers and the casualty numbers, those are the people who are being killed and maimed and wounded and, and attacked. So all, I'm, all I want to say, if you're talking about pathways, here's another one to kind of, I probably have several more if you've got the time, but, I, 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 but those are two big enchiladas. Those are two very substantial uh, changes that are going to have to be looked at and discussed and examined with the right voices at the table, and with the ability to begin implementing it on, a, on, on an understanding of Canadians that this is something we, we have to do, or should do, and can do, as opposed to kind of retreating back into a shell and saying, well, I don't think we really want those strangers here, you know, or those uh, Muslims. I mean, they, they're dangerous, right? They go around wearing funny clothes. Um, and I, you know, it's not really very nice, you know, when you think of it, that you know, a legislature of one of our provinces, you know, has now actually passed a bill uh, designating that you can't uh, wear a kneecap, <laughs> that if we can't see your nose and your mouth, you can't get a public service. Can you think of anything more ludicrous than that? But it's based upon, you know, a political wave uh, that's not mainstream yet, but it's certainly there, and it's happening in other places, and the level of discrimination and prejudice and, and uh, anti-immigration feelings is being sort of spotted in virtually every part of the country. And therefore, the response to that has to be not to hide, uh, not to ignore, but to take on directly, and that means that we get the right public policy that we can enforce, and which is based upon a partnership that all Canadians can understand. Is a perfect is the right way to manage what is a changing world and not be afraid of it. I'm going to close this with, I think, uh, probably I could have 
opened with it, and then we could have saved ourselves 20 minutes. But Charles Taylor, who's the philosopher at uh, McGill, philosopher emeritus, uh, wrote about two years ago. He said, our age makes higher demands of solidarity and benevolence on people today than ever before. Never before have people been asked to stretch out so far and so consistently and so systematically so as a matter of course to open to the strangers outside the gates a choice and opportunity. I think that's pretty good advice for Canadians. Thank you very much. Can you maybe some questions? Thank you so much. And we do have a few minutes for questions. We'll take questions from the floor, and we also have questions on Slido. Can I sit down? Uh, yes, please. Uh, it, it's age, you know. <laughs> so our first question from Slido is, if increasing our annual immigration target is dependent upon public tolerance for immigration, then shouldn't the government be putting resources into helping the Canadian public understand the economic reality of immigration, especially with the number of expected retirees. We're the converted. Uh, that's good. Uh, I think that the, uh, to go back to my theme, uh, it is clearly a question of resources. But resources will not work if there isn't uh, an effective blueprint or plan or uh, a framework in which we can apply that. And, and that's, again, part of, I think, the debates and discussions that you're having and that others are having. What's the, what's the uh, key levers in the system to make the change? And that means that uh, it's got to be part of a, uh, a broader uh, scope than just the uh, government itself. Uh, it's got to involve, clearly, the uh, private sector has to be involved. I mean, they, you know, there's some interesting examples out there. Uh, Starbucks hires 10,000 refugees. Uh, Ray and Jerry's does it. Uh, no, Ray and Jerry's is a restaurant. I think. What's the ice cream firm uh, that does it? Yeah, you got it. Um, IKEA is uh, doing some interesting work now in setting up plants in Jordan and other areas. So there's a lot of uh, scope for the economic development side of it, not just in. Uh, uh, refugee hosting countries, which are overwhelmed right now, but also in our own country. Uh, and that there's got to be, uh, I think, uh, uh, when I was in uh, immigration employment and later as a human resources minister, uh, we had a, a scheme where there was a, a series of sectoral um, conferences uh, around this issue. Uh, private sector businesses, trade unions, uh, NGO, civil society groups, settlement groups, would come together and say, uh, what can we do to make sure there's employment? Because I think that probably, uh, at least in my experience, is uh, virtually a number one requirement that there be uh, some opportunity to make choices. Not everybody will. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there's some really interesting side effects. I haven't seen the full numbers, but uh, what's been published so far by Stats Canada is that the consolidation of the child benefit is now having a very substantial impact on refugee families because they're coming in with five or six children, which means that they can get a couple thousand bucks a month to do it. So there's an income base, but that doesn't do, we're not just all economic creatures. We also you know, want to do things. We want to participate. We want to be in the community. We want to work. We want to, and it's those kinds of employment questions. And as a result, you know, there's, um, uh, I think, uh, Vic and I were just talking earlier, uh, after my sort of uh, work in Europe and, in, uh, and now in other parts of the world, I think that uh, there is so much work that needs to be done and that we're just not spending our public finances very well. Uh, we all talk about infrastructure programs and it's very nice that we can you know, build a new subway here or uh, some uh, bridges and other things. But I'm talking about major investment 
uh, in an environment in this country that is uh, depleting rapidly. Uh, the whole risk and threat of fires in the boreal forest, which covers virtually 60% uh, of Canada, is now uh, rated as one of the high-risk disaster potentials. And we'll be spending billions of dollars simply restoring uh, communities and businesses that are going to be burnt out because what's happened is because of the clean, I'm probably getting out of my, my, my pay level on this, but the impact of climate change has meant that in the boreal forest, which in my province is two-thirds of the province, that it has dried up sort of the vegetations and other kind of coverage so that it's now exposed to peat bogs. And if you have a fire in a peat bog, it's going to last 20 years. Uh, some of them never burn out because the peat goes down 20 feet and it's slow burning, but it's there. And that's now happening right across our northern area, our northern central areas. Now, are there ways of dealing with it? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you, you talked yesterday about uh, partnership with the uh, Aboriginal community. There's an area that they know well. <laughs> They've been looking after that part of the world for thousands of years. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done to clean it up, to make it safe, to provide prevention, to provide a prophylactics around the risk uh, of the beetles and the fire that can destroy these areas and basically ruin them for them. We've got a whole northern area opening up with the Northwest Passage. We have nothing up there. We have no infrastructure up there at all. If a ship sunk, we don't have a search and rescue capacity to get there. There's a whole series of things that need to be done. Uh, we, we simply have to kind of re-gauge the way in which we pay for it so that people can get some income. And it's not going to happen if we continue to, I mean, just the, uh, uh, pardon me, I, I try to be restrained, but the tax bill that went to the U.S. Congress House of Representatives yesterday, uh, reducing the tax rate of corporations down to 18 percent from 38 is criminal. It is basically undermining the public fiscal system in which you can do public goods. And part of public goods is investing in employment, getting people. And so to answer your issue, that's what I talk about resetting. I mean, I think we, uh, it's hard when you're working day, every day you know, on your very specific uh, task. You know, get up in the morning, get there, get it done, don't have enough resources. But I think at some point you have to step back a little bit and say, so what's, what's going on here? And what do we need to begin to replace, uh, redesign, uh, rethink uh, around these issues and uh, come up with it, that bigger picture? And part of it, I think, is uh, how to enhance this kind of public-private partnership so that there is employment and good schooling and it doesn't stop after the first year. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, the second Slido question. In the recently announced levels plan, immigrant targets increased incrementally, but the percentage of refugees, particularly government-assisted refugees, remains low. What are your thoughts? Well, I think part of it is uh, because of our uh, private sponsorship program, uh, I think it depends on the groups that come together to uh, offer spaces and places. Uh, the Yazidis, uh, for example, are in our city, uh, basically supported by the Jewish community um, because they feel some sense of communion with them. My wife uh, is actually a teacher in that program. And you know, this is a group of people who are ancient uh, and have been very isolated. And coming to Canada is really difficult, particularly on the women in the community, really hard on them because it's, it's culturally, it's been such a sort of closed society for women's involvement. So you have to work on that, and, you know, and, and I've been, but one of the nicest events I've been at, I was invited by my wife, she said, hey, the Yazidis are throwing a party for us uh, next week at, uh, at Sherry Zedek. I said, well, can I come? And he said, well, you know, if you behave yourself and uh, don't give two speeches too long. Uh, <laughs> and we went, and they were cooking, you know, culturally their own food, their own menus, uh, music that we, I've never heard before. And there was a first kind of coming together. And that was, that was not a, a, an a priori choice of the government. This was something that uh, that community wanted to do and supports it. So I, I think we have to be very careful that we don't 
uh, get sort of uh, too far away from the spirit of the uh, of the private sponsorship system. Because I do believe it's really something that, uh, as a model, we need to perhaps enhance. I'd like to see uh, a larger participation in it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of organizations and people who I think could join in and, and do something that uh, continues beyond one year, that actually has an extension to it, so that there is some way of maintaining the, the contact and the informality and the ability to uh, meet, pe meet, meet people from a wider range of uh, contacts in their own community. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not a great uh, five-year planner for government. Okay, I'm going to ask actually um, not the top, the top question, but the bottom question here, which is, should Canada review the safe third country agreement to better manage refugee cases arriving from the U.S.? Yeah, you should. But <laughs> it, it's hard, because you're dealing with a government in Washington that's so uncertain and so vengeful and so reactive that, uh, you know, this is called, you know, tippy-toeing through the tulips. Uh, and... Um, it, it, it is a remarkably uh, uh, unhelpful government in the world. And so we're facing, we, we, by the way, uh, there was a recent article in the Washington Post saying that uh, as the Americans move to uh, close off the uh, mandate that they had to accept uh, applications for being landed, uh, with an option that uh, over time they would become in the landed immigrant system or the refugee system, that uh, they're now considering closing that, closing that down. And it would affect particularly Central Americans uh, and a lot of Syrians, but uh, there's 300,000 people that are going to be looking for a place to go. And uh, Niagara Falls, uh, Saguenay, uh, Emerson, Manitoba, are all very like 300,000, simply because they're going to change it. Are they talking to us about it? No. So uh, we, but we have this problem that the three-party agreement takes out of the action our own diplomatic system in the United States, our consuls, and other, where you can get the right advice, where you can get the proper uh, lead-off. But uh, just on the sheer political base, that program that made a lot of sense when there was a different government that you know, played by the rules uh, is now becoming a real a major inhibitor, I think, to the kind of um, basic principles that we have as a country. Um, just so we don't get too far behind today, I think we better close and move to our first plenary. So I want to really thank the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy for an inspiring and very informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.